This morning is Mark chapter 14, and I'm reading verses 10 through 21. Mark chapter 14, 10 through 21. If you use that, uh, one of the Bibles that's here in the room, uh, 850 is where you'll find that. All right, well, let's give our attention to the Word of God. Then Judas Iscariot, one who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. That is Jesus. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and whenever, wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the evening came, when the, and when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me who is eating with me. They began to get sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes it is, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. This is God's word. We thank him for it. Would you bow with me in a prayer of preparation? Lord, it's uh, your word to us, uh, recounting what is not a very happy story. Um, it's your word that's been given to us, and it is for somehow, it is for our edification for our instruction. And so we pray, Father, that you would use this time of proclamation of your word to do something in us. God, where your word meets us, where your spirit drives it into us, somehow it produces um, in us the character of Christ. Somehow that works to more glory to you. And we pray that you would do that among us this morning. So I need your help, Father. I feel... Um, I feel weak in this right now. I need an extra measure of your grace to do this as it should be done. So glorify yourself among us, we pray. Give us all ears to hear and hearts to respond to you. Through Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <clears throat> well, I, as, as I studied this passage, I, I began to just simply ask myself, what's in a name? What's in a name? Um, Reading through the Bible, I think you know this, you discover, if you've read through the Bible, you discover that, that in many occasions names were given in almost a prophetic way. 
Right? A name was given to indicate something about that person that he or she would be doing. The name Gideon, uh, for example, meant mighty warrior. And yet when God sent the angel to him to call out to him, he was threshing his wheat in a wine press, hiding from Midianites. And yet God calls out to him and says, hey, mighty warrior. It's prophetic. He was anything but a mighty warrior. He was cowering in a hole. Yet God called him out. The name became prophetic. Um, Puritans, you know, fast forward a lot of centuries, Puritans took that idea of naming to a whole new level. Uh, you may be familiar with some names from that era. I mean, Puritans, I know they, they get a bad rap, but Puritans were, were pretty good. They, they were really, as a group of people, very concerned about the Word of God, very concerned about holding, holding to the faith. And they wanted to teach their children well. But they really took it to an extreme in the ways in which they applied names. Uh, so here are some examples from the 1600s. These were taken from a roll, a jury roll, Sussex, England. Uh, names like Accepted Traeger, Redeemed Compton. Get this one. Kill Sin Pimple. Pimple's the last name. <laughs> How about this? Fly Fornication Richardson. How would you like to have that name? Or Search the Scriptures, Morton. The Peace of God, Knight. Stand Fast on High, Stringer. <laughs> Imagine that. Hey, stand fast on high. I uh, need to talk to you. Uh, some, some girls' names. Obedenesia, I think, for obedience. Crittenden. Or how about called lower. Hope for bending. More fruit flower. Meek brewer. These are names. They're on the rolls. Safety on high snat. Mort, mortify Hicks, mortify, mortify the flesh, right? That's from the Bible. How about this? Humiliation scratcher. <laughs> How about this? And, and some had the habit of just opening the Bible, and wherever their eyes fell, that was the name. How about this one? Hugh Hagag in Pieces Robinson. Now, that's referring to the story from 1 Samuel where Saul was commanded to utterly destroy the Amalekites, but he spared King Agag. Samuel comes along, and hews him to pieces. So, hew, ag, ag, in pieces, Robinson. Uh, Obadiah, bind their kings in chains and their nobles in irons. Need him. Uh, and here, the, this one I, I, I read. Uh, a man named his dog. And he found this from the story where Jesus told the parable to the, about the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man being in hell and Lazarus being uh, in, in paradise. And he called his dog, Moreover. Why? Because moreover the dog came and licked his sores. <laughs> and uh, so next time I get a dog, I'm going to call him moreover. I really like that. Well, one, one uh, was named, found on the rolls, named Judas, not Iscariot, for obvious reasons. Well, today, because of Bible history, the name Judas, like Jezebel, if you know what she represents, th those names have fallen into disuse. But actually the name Judas is really a Greek variant of the Hebrew name Judah, right? Judah, who was the preeminent tribe of Israel, who, from who, according to Jacob's blessing, this is way back in the time of the patriarchs, according to Jacob's blessing, would, uh, from whose tribe would come the anointed king. And of course we have King David coming from that line. Judah was the name of the southern kingdom that remained more faithful to God, relatively speaking, than the northern ten tribes who, who were um, carried off into exile. Um, then, of course, we have Jesus, the promised Messiah, coming from the tribe of Judah. So Judas is the Greek variant of the name Judah. But we don't really like the name Judas. In fact, it's a byword, isn't it? The name Judas, I mean, you could use that word today. Yeah, he was a Judas. Well, what does that mean? It means betrayer now. Now, as we look at this uh, telling here in the broader picture of the Gospel of Mark, uh, everything that Jesus had done and said and taught was about him bringing his kingdom to bear, bringing the kingdom of God to bear on the present age. He had told the very first thing out of his mouth, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. He was about bringing the kingdom. And of course he would factor as the primary uh, initiator and ruler of that kingdom. He was setting himself up as that for 
for ultimately to be exalted to the right hand of God as king. But it was certainly counterintuitive to the way people expected it. But everything that Jesus had done was about the kingdom. And here we are in, in this moment where we see in the text of Scripture, this is the last day of Jesus' ministry before he's taken to, into custody and, and eventually crucified. Now, I think it's true that the disciples at this point, while they had remained, I mean, to this point, they seemed to be faithful to Jesus. All of them seemed to be of one mind. Well, where Jesus goes, we'll go. But I think we get through reading the story, if you've moved with us through the Gospel of Mark, they're, they're not quite getting it. They, they don't have the full picture. And of course they can't yet because they don't see what Jesus' death and resurrection will mean. They, that, that isn't even factoring in. Of course, Jesus by this time had predicted his own death four times, at least in, in Mark's telling. The last one, uh, you'll recall, was when uh, by Mary with that expensive ointment that she poured on him. And he said, she's anointing me in advance for my burial. Now, what is striking to me about this passage here is that we have two names. I mean, but it's how they're related to each other. You have Judas, which is Judah, and Jesus, which is Joshua. Jesus is just the Greek, name, Greek variant of Joshua. So Judas, Judah, means praise. The praise of God. That's what it should mean. Jesus means God's salvation. And who is God's salvation for? The people of God. The people who are for the praise of God. So in this little vignette here, we have these two names. Of course, the other disciples are involved, but, but these two stand out to me. And what is illustrated here is the fact that Jesus ultimately came to his own. And his own did not receive him. Uh, there's an outline in the uh, bulletin for you. I just have three simple headings as I follow through the text. So my, my hope here is just to simply gather some thoughts around these, these headings. My first heading here is simply the heart of an apostate. The heart of an apostate. The word apostate, I chose that. I mean, it's... It just simply means one who abandons a previous loyalty or one who renounces the faith. So somebody who has been in the faith and then turns his back completely is called apostate. Well, Judas clearly in this story is an apostate. But what happens here is that, that we, we see at the beginning of, of this section in verse 10, Judas, Iscariot, who is one of the twelve, he went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. Now, the other disciples, of course, don't know that. But then they're preparing for the Passover. And while they're reclining, as it were, at the table, Jesus drops the bad news on them in, in verse 18. And he says, one of you will betray me. And, and to ensure that they knew that Jesus was not just talking about one of the rest of the 120 or so that would ultimately be at the upper room, after Jesus' resurrection, or that room where, where the Holy Spirit fell. Just to, to be sure, there wasn't one of the ones maybe on the fringe. He said, one of the twelve. One who is eating with me. One who is dipping his bread into the dish with me, it says in verse 20. Now I know some take it that, that, that at that moment, Jesus was dipping his bread into a dish, and then Judas dipped his bread, and he said, you're the guy. But actually, that's not what he means because the other Gospels tell us that the, the other disciples didn't really get that Jesus had identified Judas. It's really an idiom. One who's dipping his bread in the bowl with me is saying, look, this is somebody close to me. This is what people do when they're in a family. They share a meal together. They put their bread in the same bowl. They care deeply for one another. They're close. Jesus says, this is somebody who's close to me. This is one of you. Now, it's, a, it's an excruciating moment. I know we read through this. But can you imagine? I mean, in Jesus' humanity, what the experience is. Of course, he knows this is coming. He knows why he's here. He knows that he must be handed up to the chief priests and be crucified. He knows what will befall him. And we see that played out in the garden. 
He's there praying, and we'll get to that next time. He's there praying, and, and he knows what's coming. But he sees it acted out in the one who was trusted, the one who was close to them. So what do we know about Judas? Well, we don't know a ton. We know that his surname is Iscariot. It's not significant, except perhaps that it's his family hailed from a place called Kerioth. Maybe that's what it means. Um, he is distinguished, of course, from the other, the other Judas, right? Because he's called Iscariot, because there's two Judases among the twelve. But Jesus chose him. He didn't just sort of show up at the fringe and go, well, I guess you can come along. No, Jesus specifically chose him. Um, now, he had his character flaws. One of the other Gospels tells us that because he has, had been entrusted with the money bag, he was kind of the treasurer. He ran the AR and AP. There was no payroll. But he, he, he paid the bills for the group. And he received whatever came in. Uh, we know that some wealthy women provided for their needs. But he was the one who managed the money. And we're told from another part of the, the Gospels that he liked to help himself to what was in there. So he was a thief. But those things are told in light of the fact that we know how this ends, right? But understand, the disciples are there. Judas is one of the guys. He's one of the guys. He's one of us. He's, he's in the inner circle. They weren't thinking, oh, Judas. Yeah, there's Judas again. No, they didn't know. He was close. But he had the heart of an apostate. And, and it's hard when we look at this to understand why he turned. What was it that put him over the edge? I mean, he colluded with the chief priest. So we can speculate a little bit about Judas. He went back to the chief priests. He understood he was starting to get a picture of Jesus' vision for the kingdom. He was getting a very clear picture that what Jesus was saying was very much against the religious establishment. And maybe in Judas' mind he's thinking, this guy's going too far. He's popular and all, but... You know, for the sake of Israel, for the sake of what we've got going here, for the sake of the temple, for the sake of the priesthood, for the sake of this delicate dance that we've got to do with Rome so we can keep our stuff and keep the kingdom going. I'm, again, I'm speculating here. But what was it that caused him to go there? It wasn't like he was saying that he hated Jesus from the heart, that he somehow despised him for what he was doing. I, I think it's simply... He just didn't trust him. He didn't think what Jesus was doing was on the right track. He probably thought in his mind, oh, Jesus is well-meaning, but man, he's just taking us down the wrong path. I better, I better, I better step in here. I better, I better fix this thing. I, I don't know. Again, it's, it's pure speculation, but we know at some point in time, Judas's heart grew cold to the things that Jesus was teaching. And, and he played it up. There was a pretense of trust on behalf of Judas. He acted. He acted as if he was going to continue with Jesus. He knew what Jesus' habits were. right? He knew where he would go to pray. And he used the very inside knowledge that he had of Jesus. The intimate details of how he worshipped uh, and prayed to the Father. How he, brought, how he brought the disciples along and taught them. The places that they would go. And he planned to betray him. He knew the chief priests were seeking to arrest and kill Jesus. All of the disciples obviously knew that. They, it was rumored. And he found an opportunity to go back to them. And of course we get a hint of this in that last section, right? Judas was the one who was so most vocal against Mary wasting that ointment on Jesus. Yeah, wow, this is crazy. What a waste of it. Because he's not thinking that Jesus is the man that Jesus is. Judas turned his back on Jesus because something was missing in him. Something was, was missing. He was devoid of an essential ingredient to be able to follow Jesus right to the end. As the Apostle Paul describes about those who, who might look religious, who might look like they have their stuff together. He says this, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. He here is the Spirit of Christ. And I take it that he means the Holy Spirit. But there's something in the life of one who truly belongs to Christ that causes him to endure. Listen, we all have the feelings like, 
I, I don't know if I'd make it. I don't know. I don't know if I'd endure the persecution or the suffering on behalf of my Lord. I don't know what I would do if somebody held a gun to my head and said, re, re, renounce your faith. We, we think those thoughts. I've thought those thoughts. But you know what? The reality is, if you have the Spirit of Christ, if the Holy Spirit is within you, you will. You will endure. You will face whatever you have to face. And, and Judas didn't have it. And when it came to having to decide Jesus or the chief priests, he went back to what he knew. And there's all kinds of people that attach themselves to Jesus today. We, we see this all around us, don't we? People who pray to Jesus for the things that they want. People who put a Jesus fish in the back of their car. If you have one, I'm, I don't fault you, but lots of people put those fish in their car. doesn't mean... They belong to Jesus just because they've got the fish. They go to church. They do religious things. They very much look like they're a part of the family of God. They involve themselves in the life of the church. But then something happens. They get to a point of decision. There's a crisis. There's a moment which tests their faith. Maybe they're hurt by somebody in the church. Maybe they just get lazy. And then they just drop away. And they think, yeah... That was a phase. That was a time. I used to think that. I met so many people. I baptized some of these people. And I talked to them years later. What happened? Yeah. It was a thing. It was a phase. Yeah, I, I moved on. It seems to me that the Apostle John was, was trying to encourage uh, those who read his letters. He says about such people who seem to be part of it. But they just abandoned the church. They abandoned the people of God. They just, they're gone. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. Now, I'm not saying everybody who leaves the local church is not belonging to Christ. But certainly it's true that some are. They get involved for a while. And, and that's just the reality, isn't it? You know, Jesus told parables about wheat and tares. And, and you know, the question is asked, should we, should we go and pull out the tares, the, the weeds? She said, no, that's not, not for you to do. God will settle that at the end. There's the people of God. But there's always a remnant. And the remnant was put on display. The remnant in Jesus' disciples happened to be the majority but there was one, there was one who did not have the Spirit of Christ. Well, moving on through the text then. Thinking about now the, the preparation for the Passover. My second heading is simply preparing for the Passover lamb. Now understand this, that the Passover, that was a highlight for Jews. You know, whatever has happened in our culture, whether... Um, whether it has religious foundations or not, or whether it's moved into something else for many people, the way Christmas is celebrated has its religious heritage, right? It's a highlight for the culture. And, and, and I'm convinced that Passover had become that, a highlight, because it's how they understood themselves to be the people of God. This is how we know we're Jews. We do this thing. This is Passover. And so the disciples couldn't imagine that Jesus would would move through the season without somehow giving this the focus, right? So they ask him the question, where do you want us to prepare so you can do the Passover? And it tells us there's an interesting series of events that shows that God had this whole thing planned out that Jesus knew exactly how this was going to go down and that they must, in fact, celebrate the Passover. Not that it would just somehow happened by accident, but that it was in fact planned in the heart and mind of God from eternity past, that this thing was going to go down. And verse 12 highlights the series of interesting events. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, the disciples asked where they wanted him to prepare it. So Jesus says, he tells them, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go into a city. You're going to look for a particular servant who happens to be carrying water. And that person's probably unknown to them. But that servant has a master who has this large upper room and it is suitable for the Passover. And they go and they find the guy. It's all planned out. 
Now given the place that this has in Jesus' ministry and passion, I ask myself the question, how does, how does Passover relate to Jude, how does Passover relate to Judas' betrayal? I think there's a connection. I don't want to push it too far. See, I, for me at least, it brings it into clearer focus that, that God came in Jesus, came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Judas, Judah, the namesake of the people of God, was the very one to turn on Jesus. Now, I, I don't know what people thought of lambs in Bible times, but lambs figure very prominently, of course, in the Passover celebration, because that's what you sacrifice, right? But there's something about a lamb, a little lamb. They look innocent, they're clean, they got the soft wool. I, you know, there's that classic picture of the Jesus holding the lamb, right? You have the picture of him going to find that one who's wandered away from the flock, the lamb, the cute little lamb. And I think out of all of the livestock that we might keep, it would be the one you're least likely to use for, to abuse, right? A calf, maybe, you know, brand them, push them through. But the lamb, the lamb's like the pet. The lamb is so unassuming and playful, maybe. I, I don't know, I don't think about lambs, but at least what I've seen in pictures, they're cute. So, but the lamb is the one that gets chosen to be slaughtered. And of course, of course that is pointing forward to Christ when it's brought in the Passover. The pure, spotless lamb. That lamb who was offered at the Passover to, to signify that thing that must die in order for the firstborn to be protected from death in each family. That thing that must die, his blood painted over the doorposts and on the lentils of, of the house. That Passover lamb would be, would be sacrificed. And Jesus here is celebrating that Passover. The disciples understand the significance of that. And I think he does that. I think he does it on purpose. The timing of his crucifixion, the timing of his betrayal at Judas' hand who represents the namesake of the people of God. The Jews, the people of the tribe of Judah, turning his hand against Jesus to make him become, that is Jesus, to make him become the very Passover lamb. Jesus knew he was born to die. Verse 21 we see in our text. It says, for the Son of Man goes, as it is written of him, in the context of talking about what, what, what this betrayer will do. Jesus knows he's born to die. It was prophesied back in Genesis, right? In fact, the curse on the serpent that uh, the seed of the woman would crush his head. It was prophesied in the Psalms. It was prophesied in Isaiah. John the Baptist, maybe unlike all of the other disciples, John the Baptist had some sense of this, right? Remember when he announced him coming on the scene, he says to the crowd, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He got it. And following his conversion, of course, the Apostle Paul saw clearly that Jesus was a Passover Lamb. What does he say in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 to 8? Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us, therefore, celebrate the festival of the Passover, right? Not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of of sincerity and truth. Because of what Christ has accomplished, we, we, we have been rescued from malice and evil, the stuff that would condemn us. We have been rescued from that. The Israelites were rescued from the bondage in Egypt. We have been rescued from a greater bondage, that of sin, which would lead surely to our eternal condemnation. And Jesus' blood was shed as the Passover lamb so that the angel of death would not visit, visit us. But, but what the Apostle Paul knows, and I think what we all know, is that even the most religious matters, even the most seemingly devout people, 
can become corrupted by fleshly motivations, bitterness, lack of forgiveness, selfishness, the stuff, the stuff in the apostate heart of Judas. But because of the cross of Christ, because of Jesus himself, for all that stuff that was in us, for all who have faith in the Lord Jesus, we see him as our Passover lamb, don't we? And we see that our sin was taken away and was put upon him at the cross so that we no longer fall under God's condemnation and we have freedom. Well, finally, my last heading here is, is simply woe, woe. This whole thing is a bad news story, really. I mean, apart from what we know it accomplishes, but we're sitting right in the middle of some ugliness. Yes, there's a Passover celebration, but, but it's tainted, isn't it? It, 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 feels, it feels heavy. It feels foreboding. It feels dark because we know it's coming down. And we know the horror what, of what Jesus will face. We know... We know, at least it's communicated to us, because the other disciples who aren't responsible, they're responding to this. Is it me with this profound grief? I, I can't Im It wouldn't be me, Lord. It wouldn't be. Tell me it's not me. Judas knows it's him. But he's faking his way through. And the other disciples are, are desperate to know it's not them. But Jesus says, upon that one, the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, Whoa. Whoa. Now that's a, that's a Bible word. If there ever was one, right? Not hold the horse back. Not whoa, whoa, whoa. Now there's two ways you can take that word. Whoa is kind of the sorry state of someone who's bent on sin. Uh, or the stor sorry state of anybody in, in really lousy circumstances. They're in a woeful situation. But I think there's a, a heavier woe to this. It's the sad state of one who is under the curse of God. It's like the prophet Isaiah. Remember this in Isaiah chapter 6. He has this vision of the Lord in the temple. A vision. And he sees the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe fills the temple. And, and his first, the first thing out of the prophet's mouth is, Woe is me. I am undone. Woe. I'm in a sad state. I'm coming under the condemnation of God for I've seen the glory of God and there's no way I can stand in His presence without being consumed. I get me because I see Him. That's woe. And Jesus says to the one who betrays the Son of Man, woe, a curse. Why? Why did Judas do what he did? Because he made, as the prophet Jeremiah says, he made flesh his strength. He trusted in his mind. He trusted in what he thought. He didn't trust in Christ. He didn't trust in God. I'll read it from Jeremiah. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Judas, the betrayer, Trusted in what he thought. Again, I'm speculating about his motivations. But I can't imagine that it was because he, Jesus did something to offend him and now he's going to get him back. No, I think it had to do with alternate visions of the kingdom. Instead of trusting Jesus, he trusted the old guard, the chief priests and the, the scribes. You know, it, it's true. While Judas is put on display here as kind of the chief betrayer, the chief condemned person. He represents in a sense all who might turn away from Christ. And, and the Lord Jesus in his own teaching told his disciples, he told those that were uh, assembled to hear him preach, he told them, look, there's all kinds of people that think they know me. They pretend to know me, but they're trusting in themselves. Remember this, I, I read this often, but I come back to it often because it, it just tells me something about the kind of faking or, or the ignorance that goes on in the minds of people. Because he says this, Jesus in Matthew 7, 20, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, just stop there. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Do you know when you see a name twice in the scriptures? Peter, Peter, when Jesus said that, you're going to betray me. You're going to deny me. There, there's, a, there's a measure of affection there. It's like me saying to my wife, Kathy, Kathy. Actually, Kath. I would call her Kath. But you know what? If I say her name twice, it's like it's a measure of affection. And people are coming to Jesus saying, Lord, Lord, we're the people that love you. 
Not everyone who says that to me will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Judas did those things. I'm sure he was among the 72 that Jesus sent out. He probably cast out demons. He probably did mighty works in the name of Jesus. I'm sure he's talking about Judas. Before Judas even knows that he's Judas. At least as we know Judas. But what does he say? I've done all these things and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. In truth, Jesus never knew Judas. Not in the knowing sense that he belonged to him. Judas pretended to be Jesus' friend, but Jesus knew he wasn't really his friend. It was the plan of God, we find out from the scripture, for Judas to betray Jesus. It was prophesied. He was called the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. This is in the Gospel of John. But anyone, anyone, who would turn from what God has revealed and turn to their own thing, is really a betrayer like Judas. The one who lives under God's sovereign rule and thinks that he lives by his own power and ingenuity forgets God. He is a betrayer. The one who enjoys God's common grace, all of the good stuff that God has given in the world, and then thinks that he deserves it. He is one who has betrayed the Lord. The one who sees the glory of creation, the intricacies of the universe, and concludes that it brought itself into existence and denies God who made it. He is like Judas. And the one who compares himself with those around counts up his righteous acts, comforts himself that he is better man and deserving of God's favor. He is like Judas with the heart of an apostate. The writer of Proverbs says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. And if the Lord weighs your heart this morning, where will it be? Are you trusting in yourself, in your own vision, in your own stuff? Or are you looking to Jesus? Throwing yourself at his mercy for him to lead, for him to choose. Knowing that he is good through and through. And even if he asks you to walk through suffering, even if through difficulty, you know that he is the Son of God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Well, there's not much else to say. I don't really know how to conclude this except to say... Look at your own heart this morning. Friends, do not be like Judas. And you think, well, I wouldn't turn my back on a close friend. But I've just given you a list of ways where if you're trusting in you and not in him, the same fate will come to you. But, but God is merciful and you need not remain there. Put your trust in Christ today. Unequivocally put your trust in Christ and for the rest of us who have enjoyed this blessing of being in the family of God. I, I think what it tells us is that we have to be aware that there are always wolves among the sheep. We must be careful. We must be compassionate. We must continue to pray that God's mercy will meet them like it's met us. And we must guard our own hearts against the kinds of temptations to be drawn into, I think my way is better than God's way. To set aside the things of God and, and think, I, I've got this, got this handled. Very general application, I understand, but God is gracious. He has sent His one and only Son so that you might know Him and know forgiveness in His name. May your uh, faith in Christ be strengthened. And if you have not trusted him, I trust you put your faith in him today. Would you pray with me? Our Father, uh, we know um, what Jesus had to go through. It was necessary. It, it accomplished ultimately the purpose of him becoming our Passover lamb. Now we get to look back in that event. Christ crucified, risen, and now reigning at the right hand of God the Father. We see that from your scriptures. And we now know 
that there is no rock, there is no foundation for anything apart from Christ. Confirm us in that faith because of all that he has done. First to glorify you, Father, but then to bring us through your everlasting love and grace into a place in your kingdom. We thank you. Lift our hearts up with the knowledge and confidence of your grace. We thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Frame.